I'd like to uh, welcome Richard Hartman uh, to talk about the social aspects of change. Uh, and if you ever need somebody to deface your Monty with something amusingly inappropriate, this is the guy for the job. <laughs> welcome. Um, I'm Richard, somewhat involved with Prometheus. Uh, and if you want to work in the Munich area, do let me know. So some background. Why is there social stuff at a monitoring conference? This sounds weird at first, but basically this is about how you can enact change within a company and changing the monitoring system is one of the most fundamental things which you can do. I learned most of this the hard way after being 11 years at the old job and pretty much knowing everything. Uh, I switched to a new job and everything was new. And there were a lot of established systems, old ones, weird ones, no two teams had the same tools or instrumentation or what have you. It was really, really very naturally grown, <laughs> to use the positive term. And most of you will know this uh, in, in some form or other. Um, when I actually... Am I good on the mic? Okay, okay. it sounds weird here upstairs, but okay. Um, so at first, uh, when, when I switched uh, jobs, I also wanted to switch over FOSDEM and plan to do it with LibreNMS. Then Merle suggested I do uh, look at Fosdem, uh, sorry, at Prometheus, and within like two days or three days, I was a convert because it's just better. But you know, um, if you want to calculate change, um, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, uh, these formulas, formulas might even be valid, but it, unless you have proper inputs, it's pretty, pretty much useless. The, the real thing is that the hardest problems you have to solve are not the technical ones. These are the social ones. Technical stuff is relatively easy because you've got a computer and you sit down and you hack at it until it's done, unless it's NP complete or something, but else um, it's, it's within your means to fix it somehow. With social problems, uh, it's an unbounded problem. There's so many things to take into account and every single situation will be different. With technical stuff, mostly most situations will be mostly the same-ish. Social, it's all different all the time. Or is it? Because there are some underlying things which, which I realized. And talking to people, um, many, many other people see the same. You often have incentives within companies or projects or whatever which run directly counter to change. Developers might care about new releases, operations type people, they want to have sleep and they want to have stability. So they, by their very definition of what they get their money for, they are resistant to change. And this is because change is hard, unless you somehow automate and well embrace change in a way that actually works for you and for everyone else in the company or the project or what have you. And there will be lots of discussions about trade-offs because you might have someone who tells you, no, I don't believe that this will be uh, a positive change or this will actually save me time or some, something like that. That'll always happen. Also, a lot of systems must run for, for some time at least in parallel, especially monitoring because that's what you verify your systems with. So actually you double the work because now you have the old system and you have the new system. Both need to work in parallel and both need to be maintained. People really love that when you tell them, hey, do twice the work. Um, so how do you get them to do this? Also, if you've got well-established processes or well-established tools and you show a new way, in some way you often encounter that if you are right, someone else must be wrong. And most often those people who consider themselves wrong or at, at risk of being proven wrong or what have you, those are the people who are long at the company and who have some investment, at least on some sort, within the hierarchy. So those are actually people able to, to actually block whatever you're trying to do. Unless you actually give them a way to, to accept the change without losing face. And quite often you'll have hidden motivations. It might be as simple as someone liking the color of the UI or whatever. I had countless discussions about Grafana being black default or white default. 
I don't care. <laughs> but some people care really, really strongly. And you, you kind of have to take this into account. They might also be out to get you, or they might fear you want their job, or whatever. But th these are things which you have to keep in mind. And while these formulas for change might be uh, more of a comedic relief, um, there are some underlying truths which really, really you have to take into account. I don't know if you're familiar with the Iron Law of Institutions. It's basically the very short version is um, people would rather see their whatever organization fail than lose power within the organization. And every one of you can think of at least a few examples of this happening somewhere around you be it professionally or be it privately or somewhere else. People cling to whatever power they perceive to have. And you have to take this into account because this is something which happens. And the other thing which is also extremely important, there is this concept of four stages of competence. And again, it's probably pretty uncontroversial um, that this is the path you go through, no matter what kind of field or, or expertise you're looking at. It's always the same. At first, you don't realize that you're actually incompetent. Then you kind of notice that you don't really know a lot of things. Then you're cautiously uh, knowledgeable about stuff. And then at some point, hopefully, it just goes into your blood and into your being, and you just know what's right, and you don't even know how you know. But the thing is, who will fight the most? It'll be the unconscious people. Because, and also the uncompetent people, because they can't even grasp what you're kind of trying to do. So you have a few of the really, really good people maybe, and you have a lot of the not quite so good people who still have a voice and still want to be heard, um, and they will fight for whatever reason. And also, if you look at the key people who could support you, because they are the actual ones who can enact change within whatever organization you're in, those are the ones who will be cautious, because a lot of them will be in, oh, we can't see it, in, in the third group. Uh, that's actually where most people hopefully sit. Um, and this means that those people who could actually grab your banner and run with it, they won't, because they're so cautious and they're They'll wait until they know if it's good. And there are a few killers. If you run into those, um, forget your change. <laughs> uh, if you impact revenue, uh, management will tell you to stop, period. If you bring essential system down, the same. If you wake up people quite a lot, uh, it's, it's coming from a different angle, but still people will just try to stop you in whatever you do. And you have to keep this in mind when you're doing anything which is challenging the status quo. So what are approaches to, to fixing this? One, and this is probably the first thing you want to do once you have a sort of ish concept of what you want to do, and this will change over time, and it will, it is, at first it will be very functional and, and very abstract, and then it will start to become more specific. It's a process I'm going through myself with uh, introducing Prometheus at work. Uh, you literally, or probably, put a big picture on the wall and tell people, this is what I want to have in the end. Can we agree on having this in the end? And the reason why I think you should agree on having this in the end is because this little part is what you care about. You might agree that it fits, fits in a big picture and you'll always have a few people who get this and run with you, but most people you just show them what they care about and that's where you start. So what you're basically doing is you're playing to their own intrinsic or internal motivation. That what, what does this guy do? What does that woman want? ETCPP. That's what you, what you have to, to get at. And then you get buy-in from a few key pillars. They might be management, they might be technical. Yeah, ideally they're both. And even if you're not in the room or not part of the meeting or you have distributed teams all over the world, if as long as enough people agree on this big picture, if they make any decision going forward about how to implement X, they might look at the big picture and decide, okay, well, I could do it this way that might not align and I can do it that way that will align with the big picture. And so you have some sort of distributed thinking of actions across whatever your organization is. Because they all agree they want to end up over here and not over there. Quite easy, in theory. 
The next thing comes again to the intrinsic motivations of the people. Someone once said, um, and this has stuck for me like forever, for years now, uh, that it's quite easy to talk to an engineer about a function. And he'll talk for hours and hours, and he'll get back to you and talk again about this, this function. Try it with the CEO. He literally will not care. And why should he? Because it's none of his concern. He doesn't have to care. He never cared in his life, and he never ever will care. And that's fully okay. Because in his picture of the world, it's irrelevant, or he has people for it. So this is something you, you have to take into account. Measures, they will obviously care about revenue, because else the company is dead, easy. And they want that processes, however they're defined, are executed. They don't really care about the details of the process design, but they care about the execution. Architects, they actually care about the design, and they actually care about the definition of the process, and actually how the details of the process should look like. Service and product owners, they mostly care about pretty dashboards or maybe Excel sheets, or you export the data in whatever form you need. But as long as they get the data out of whatever they need, they're pretty happy. So for example, we switched our, our internal accounting of how we calculate the cost of a, a mailbox, which you can buy at our company, to Prometheus, because it's quite easy to have storage per, uh, per, per mailbox on average, both by customer and by domain and by total. And so it's quite easy to, to get an actual cost of one single average mailbox. So product management is using that data to make prices for the product. And suddenly, they like the system. Team leads obviously care about teams being happy. That's kind of obvious. And engineers mostly care about sleep. And sometimes also social life. <laughs> yeah, Julius agrees. <laughs> uh, because time is pretty much the most precious commodity for all of those guys, but the engineers are the ones who quite often invest the most time and personal time. So basically what you do is you tell everyone what they need to hear but you never ever lie. You always point to the big picture and you tell this is the place, you care about that one and maybe also about that one, but this is the big picture. If you want to sit down, read through it, everything's in the open. But only tell them what they really need to hear, never lie, and if they're interested, tell them more. If not, doesn't matter. They know what they care about, that's enough. Another approach is sheer luck. <laughs> like literally sheer luck. Um, the backstory of this was I found stuff in our internal uh, systems and I know I could monitor it. I didn't really even know what it did. It turns out there were mail, mail gateways. I didn't care. I don't even care today. Um, but I found them and I decided to enable monitoring for them within Prometheus. And I told a few people and like, I don't know, a week later, two weeks later, someone set a wrong flag in the server config. And all of a sudden, this server accepts outside email. And then the spammers come and they do a real clean engineering ramp up of the server. They try how much load can it take. And they basically go like this when you look at, at the email, which is quite good engineering. Unfortunately, they're the bad guys. So <laughs> uh, what happens uh, at some point during the night, because obviously they would know what, what time zone we are living in, they go full throttle. And our mail servers and our mail gateways start to become quite unhappy. And the on call, because he knew he had that new system and was keen to play with it, he literally, and you can ask him, he's sitting over there in a blue shirt. <laughs> yes, the one going like that. Uh, he literally told me afterwards that it took him about 30 seconds after he was in the VPN to actually debug the problem as opposed to at least an hour across several different people. So it's actually more than more than just 60 minutes, which would have been wasted. And it's at night, people want to sleep. And so he just sees, okay, that's what's the problem. He fixes it, he goes back to sleep. And on the next day, he's standing next to my desk and like, great, because this helped me. And other people hear this, other people see this, and all of a sudden you have more buy-in from other people. And it was sheer luck in the timing. But still, this is a valid approach because it worked really well. And you'll also always have one of, or two of those. That you do something and you don't even intend for it to be useful, but as long as it's well executed and you keep people informed, at some point it'll help someone and they'll be happy about it and they'll talk about it. So 
there is a few carrots which you can dangle in front of people. Coming back to engineers, which in a monitoring conference is probably what you care about, it's sleep, again. Um, and there's a few simple rules, which are somewhat monitoring or service uh, specific, but still this is something which you can just put in front of people and you'll get buy-in from a lot of engineers because that's what they care about. It's the mantra of Prometheus, at least partially. If it's not actionable, it's not an alert. If it's not urgent, it's not an alert. If it's important but not urgent, you can do it the next day, business day. Doesn't matter. If it becomes urgent, you can still call uh, on call and they can fix it once it's urgent, but not when it's only important. Uh, if there's no playbook, it doesn't go into production. If you don't have any SLOs internally, it doesn't go into production. If it doesn't have any alerting, it doesn't go into production. These are very, very simple and very, very obvious rules, but these all of a sudden enable your engineers to sleep more, and they will love you. And you have buy-in. Toil. Uh, if someone read the SRE book, you're familiar with the term. If you didn't, basically toil is any work which has no lasting benefit, which you do manually, and which scales roughly linearly with the amount of services or machines or users or whatever. If people are busy firefighting because there's just more services, more users, more whatever, they will not have time to properly engineer the actual systems. And they will hate that state because they want to engineer, else they wouldn't be engineers. You obviously have to keep legacy working, and that's the due diligence again, and that's where you have more work, not less work, for a short period of time. But you should keep the extra effort low, obviously. You should strive for at least a few small immediate benefits, not maybe even because they are hugely important, but just to show people, okay, here's a carrot, here's breadcrumbs, this works, go with me, and we'll end up in a better place. And obviously, focus on removing, on removing the actual toil. Then you have, that's obviously Prometheus specific, the leverage within Prometheus. Because you've got one system for all the things, you, have, you can suddenly have totally different problem domains correlated with each other. For example, if your, if your optical long haulings go down when the temperature outside drops or it just has a large change, that's some sh something which can actually happen in real world optical networks. That's something which you probably, because it's the same system which monitors outside temperature and your optical networking, you, just, you can correlate. Correlate does not imply causation, but still you can correlate. Uh, or data center load against a uh, new service running because this is obviously a cost factor, and so you can put that back into, into, your, into your pricing. And lots more, and it's all PromQL. You also have this system of an oracle, because all of a sudden you have one source of truth, and people tend to not really disagree when the data they're basing their assumption on is roughly the same. If you're running more than one Prometheus, they might not fully agree, but roughly they'll agree. So you have one source of truth for all the things which you need, be it dashboards, be it PDFs, be it something which a, a sales drone can just put in front of a potential customer and tell them, okay, across all our services, our SLO is at least X. That's something they really like because all of a sudden they can prove to potential customers, hey, that's what we have. That's how good we are. And it's really, really, really easy to get at the data. And all of a sudden, salespeople talk positively about the monitoring engineering is using. That's quite a weird feeling. But this is something, again, you have someone within the company who is helping you push the change. They might talk to someone at the water cooler who's blocking change at the moment and tell them, hey, this is really useful for me. And suddenly you have more buy-in. Yeah. There's also one other thing that is not related to social challenges. Um, Currently, we are working on, and I'm just mixing this into the thing because I have the slot anyway. Um, <laughs> currently, uh, we are working on spinning Prometheus for exposition format into its own thing, into its own project. It's called Open Metrics, at least for now. We do plan to publish an RFC, 
simply because um, a, this helps with some old school vendors, especially in the networking segment. And also if you're able to slip a random RFC into a public tender or in a requirements list or somewhere, all of a sudden you are legally requiring a vendor to provide Prometheus metrics. This is really nice. <laughs> so yeah, we'll do that. Uh, if you're interested, the info is there. And now I'm taking questions on both of these. Ben? Thank you, Richard. Um, where's my mics? There's I have mics. no idea. Do -ba -do, where was the hand? I didn't saw. I would hope there's about roughly 440 hands in here. <laughs> if you want, I can think of 40 questions. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I would like to ask you for an advice on uh, how to convince uh, developers to agree to use actually any monitoring system. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a really good one for that. A um, uh, couple weeks ago. What? What? You're interrupting people again. Yes. <laughs> But I'm going to interrupt you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, I had I had a really great one for that. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a developer and and an administrator were arguing over what to set for a timeout, and all we had to do was go into the metrics and find out what the 99.9th percentile was for the timeout, and then that just stopped the argument because we could, we had data to make a decision. So having the instrumentation and having the metrics uh, allowed us to make a informed decision instead of the database developer thought the timeout was too short and the administrator thought the timeout was too too long. We just needed to look at the data and see what would cause the acceptable amount of user harm by changing the timeout. Do we have this on tape? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Also, I'll, 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 I'll stop interrupting Richard. Yeah. Also, if you're familiar with error budgets, that's something which... Uh, helps convince developers because basically it's a concept of you have X downtime per service per month or per whatever time frame you have, and you can use that for downtime, you can use it for, for changes, you can do it for whatever. In extreme cases, you just use it for downtime to force people to not overly rely on your service. And basically this gives you an interdependency of, of developers and operations, and all of a sudden this is a metric which they really, really have to care about because either they use it for, for breakage or for features and to actually get the time and to actually get their error budget, they have to integrate monitoring. But for example, now if I want to make them to use Prometheus, uh, they would need to learn everything about writing an exporter and uh, use that in their applications. And would it be the, I, the thought I have uh, just to tell them uh, uh, to write some exporter in JSON format, and then I write uh, exporter for Prometheus, like the proper way to use labels. And Whatever the price. Um, personally, I I help people uh, with what their metric names should be, what their label set should be, um, and if they do it literally by hand and do a print statement, I'm fine with that, as long as they get the data into Prometheus. And once they're converts, they'll do everything else by themselves anyway. But make it as easy as possible for them to get benefit, or the more evil way to just show where you have interdependencies within your organization, where other people would depend on X being implemented, and it's not. And just because you've got a nice little big picture, and there's a blind spot. Okay, thank you. And people will start arguing with that team. <laughs> <laughs> Over here. Um, so I have a question regarding, first of all, thank you for the great talk. I think the, the social aspect of it is always extremely interesting because, as you said, it's always about people. Um, in almost all of the companies that I've worked for, I've almost always seen this iron rule of power sort of happening. Uh, I didn't know that was the term for it. Um, but I've never really had a way to sort of mitigate it or to do anything about it. Um, I was, I don't know, I was wondering from the perspective of like an engineer, how have you dealt with this type of problem? Because, you know, it's, it's a problem that happens over a period of time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, well, 
In my personal situation, uh, having buy him from the CEO helps. Um, so that's kind of because he can push people who you can't push. But in the generic case, um, there is a certain cutoff. And when you really are within an organization where you have tried everything, what you can reasonably try, and everything you're willing to try, that's one of my personal, or it would be one of my personal cutoffs to just say, okay, I'm done, goodbye. Because if you're really in a situation where you think you have to do something in a certain way, no matter if you're wrong or right, but you are convinced that you need this to work properly, i.e. to really be happy during working hours. And you can't make this happen. You're in the wrong organization. It's harsh, but that's the end consequence. There's a lot of steps before, but as soon as you're aware of, I'm not stuck, I can actually get out if I really need to, uh, this changes context in your mind. And this actually sometimes gives you different angle in arguments with your team leader or whatever. Because you can talk about different things. You, you don't have to talk about this is what I would like to do and blah, blah, blah. You can, talk, you can say, okay, this is what I think would be best. It's okay if I don't get buy-in, but at a certain point, I need to leave. And if they value you, uh, that's something they'll listen to. So to sum it up, it's about having a good relationship with like management and also trying to push a certain agenda that you deem is a responsible and a constructive one. Well, it actually uh, it definitely makes it easier when you have uh, good contact to people. Um, that's obvious. Um, or if you're just able to decide, that's basically the same thing, or almost. Um, if you're really the only one, no matter what other levels you have, if you get all the team leads to agree on something, that's already quite important, or just a few key players. So you don't need to have the big hammer to, to smash everyone else. It's, but if you really are alone, um, yeah, you lost. Thank you. No worries. One more question over here. Um, it's not really a question. I just wanted to ch chime in on the previous question. It is like, how can I make the developer to uh, to write, to, to instrument their code? I think sometimes there's a little bit of disconnection between the development team and the, the, pro the production operations team. And developers feel like that whenever the, the dev is ready, they just hand it to, to the operation teams and then that's their problem. So there is a little bit of disconnection there. What I would suggest is to practice more the uh, DevOps approach and this in, in, in DevOps approach, so to involve developers also to actually uh, manage the operations side of the things or like uh, managing services in production and give them much more ownership because if they feel like their service has gone down because there is not yeah. enough monitoring or something's gone bad, right. but you don't know what really went bad, but they feel like it's not their responsibility, it's not their problem, you will never be able to force them to use a monitoring system. And I'm a developer myself, and no one ever told me use Prometheus because it's good for uh, monitoring, etc. I just felt like whenever something was going wrong in production, I just couldn't fix it because I didn't know what was going on. And since I had completely ownership of APIs, systems, whatever, I felt I have to do something more. So uh, maybe the, this, there is this little bit of this connection that if uh, more ownership is given to the development team, they will feel like I have to put the extra effort and really uh, integrate Prometheus in, in, in create dashboards on Grafana so that I can tell when something has, goes bad that it is, I don't know, latency, it is network, is whatever. I don't know if that's a little bit uh, the previous question. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to have a 15-minute break now, so get some co more coffee. More coffee. <laughs>